You know, so far this season, Ravens running back J.K. Dobbins has three games under his belt since returning from last year's torn ACL. But Baltimore has been super careful with his workload and the much talked about pitch count. Yeah, it's clearly still in play. Yeah, and watching his Thursday media appearance, Dobbins is certainly trying to show patience and is even biting his tongue, but he clearly wants to be unleashed. I'm Bobby Trossett with Sarah Ellison. It's Friday, October 14th, and this is your morning Ravens vault. Wink Martindale had a lot to say about why he wanted to leave Baltimore after last season. And then he gave a strong endorsement of Lamar Jackson as an MVP quarterback. Plus, should the Ravens explore the possibility of bringing in Carolina Panthers wide receiver DJ Moore before the league's trade deadline? We'll dive into that conversation. Yeah, we have all of that and more coming up. Thanks for waking up with the Morning Vault, where you get the most important Ravens news in just 15 minutes. All right, Bobby, we both know how much of a die-hard competitor J.K. Dobbins is. We also know how frustrating his grueling rehab process has been over the course of the last year as he's worked his way back from that torn ACL. Oh, yeah. This guy has a burning fire from within, and he quite simply wants to be contributing at all times. Unfortunately for Dobbins, though, Sarah, he's yet to truly be unleashed by the powers that be in Baltimore. In Sunday's win over Cincinnati... Number 27 was used on just 40% of Greg Roman's offensive snaps, and he received eight of the 13 running back carries. Not to make something out of nothing here, but his snap count did decrease from 35 in week four to 26 in week five. Nonetheless, here's G. Rowe. Really happy to see J.K. I really felt he took a huge step forward last week with his running style, you know, where he's at. And, uh, you know, the one play where he broke like three tackles and got us the first down, you know, that's that's the J.K. Dobbins that uh, that we were accustomed to seeing. So that was great. Bobby, Dobbins forced three missed tackles on eight carries against the Bengals. So when is he going to be let loose? Sarah, all I know is that John Harbaugh and his staff, as you know, are following extremely strict and regimented plans for those returning from serious injuries. And Dobbins and Ronnie Stanley find themselves at the top of that list. Now, ESPN reporter Jamison Hensley caught up with Dobbins on Thursday and asked him if he tried to convince his coaches to give him a green light for what ended up becoming Baltimore's game-winning drive on Sunday night against the Bengals. Listen to this. Well, you know I didn't play a whole fourth quarter. Uh, I know. So, uh, no, because I just let the coach do it. It's, as long as we win, I'm fine. Like, that's, that's what it's all about. You know, we got Lamar, you know, he carried the team on that, on that drive, you know. And I, I, it hurt not being out there with him, but I, I got to be patient. All right, so again, that is locker room audio from Jamison Hensley there, but... It's abundantly clear to me at this point, Bobby. Dobbins almost can't help himself. He is yearning for a starter caliber workload again. And he just wanted so badly to say that, but is trying to exercise that patience. Sarah, since our audience may not have seen the visual to go along with Hensley's audio, let me just paint this picture because it was too good not to. At the start of the video, Dobbins almost smirks and then takes a long, long pause before asking Jameson, well, you know, I didn't play the whole fourth quarter. And then at the end, his I got to be patient there that you just heard also came with an even better smirk. I think the moral of the story from my perspective, Sarah, is that this is a dude who continues to say and do all the right things publicly. But the bottom line seems to indicate that he knows he's more than capable of having a lot more on his current plate and his patience it seems to be thinning week by week. All right, still to come here on The Vault, Wink Martindale opened up about his departure from the Ravens. So, Sarah, we talked on Thursday's Morning Vault about Wink Martindale's departure from Baltimore after coaching under John Harbaugh for a decade. Now, John Harbaugh gave the impression that there was no animosity when the two sides parted ways when he met with the media earlier this week, so... We're all wondering, does Wink share that same sentiment? Yeah, I mean, it may not seem possible because nobody likes to be fired, but it really does sound like it was what Wink wanted. It was what both sides wanted. Now, at his press conference in New York, Wink talked glowingly 
about many people still at the Ravens. He said Harbaugh is like a, quote, brother to him, and he knows the whole family, including coaching with Harbaugh's dad. He said Steve Bashotti took care of him and that Ozzie Newsom was a mentor. You know I'm going to play devil's advocate on this, Sarah, right? Like, if everything was so good, why did Wink want to leave? That's fair, because there were some other devil's advocates up in New York, and that is exactly what they asked him. Here's what he said. It's just one of those things. That I always believe that wherever you're at is where you're supposed to be. John and I had conversations way back but you know before they made the announcement of about where we wanted to be and what we wanted to do and you know I know there was going to be a lot of movement in the NFL and I thought myself and it has re-energized me uh, you know for myself to go someplace new and 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 try to build it again we're we're family John and I are it's it's it was nothing negative it was nothing it was just it was just time and when I say it's just time it was just time for both of us and then Wink was later asked about what his emotions were once he knew for sure that he was leaving Baltimore and starting anew somewhere else. Yeah, I was happy and excited about the next chapter. There was no sadness for you? No, I mean, you're going to miss people. Wink was, Wink was, was, uh, part, was part of it leaving to go somewhere new and help build something. Was part of it, like, it's no secret you want to be a head coach. Right. Was part of it allowing your defense and your scheme and the difference you make you know, to not receive more credit, but get highlighted more somewhere where maybe people will notice it? No, I, I, just, I just like to see players have success. And I, I didn't think that deep into it, no. Sarah, he definitely tried to downplay his whole desire for a head coaching job as a part of the reason for leaving. Do you buy that? I mean, I do buy it to a certain extent because, I mean, think about it. Almost everyone listening to this podcast, you and I both, We've been in situations before that just get stale and you just need a change. So you're in a place for 10 years. Yeah, I can see that that gets stale. So I do believe that that was part of his reason for leaving. But Wink has also been pretty darn vocal for years about wanting to become a head coach. And hey, that's almost all coaches goals, right? So that's no surprise. But if Wink is looking around the castle in Baltimore he could surmise pretty quickly that that opportunity wasn't coming anytime soon. Steve Bishotti likes continuity. Steve Bishotti likes John Harbaugh. So yeah, going to an organization that has more coaching turnover, like in New York, probably doesn't hurt his chances in taking a step toward a head coaching job. And for whatever reason, he just didn't get a lot of looks from around the league for head coaching opportunities while he was at Baltimore. So hey, why not change things up and go get a new fresh start, and see if you can get looked at elsewhere. All right, enough of that. Let's turn our attention to the actual game. Why don't we? We don't usually think of coordinator quarterback matchup, Sarah, but in this one we do because no opposing defensive coordinator knows quarterback Lamar Jackson like Wink knows him. And by the same token, Jackson knows Wink pretty well too after so many practices against each other the last four plus seasons in Baltimore. Yeah, exactly. We mentioned this on Thursday. There really isn't a big advantage for either side, but it will be very interesting to see how much Wink decides to blitz Lamar. Now, not surprisingly, we know this after his years in Baltimore. No big news flash here. The Giants now lead the league so far this season in blitz rate at about 40%, and they've been successful with it. But at the same time, Jackson has played really, really well when teams decide to blitz him. Lamar has the highest passer rating in the league at 124.0 and has the most touchdowns with seven when he's faced against the blitz. So I say, bring on the blitz, Wink. Man, I am super interested to see if Wink sticks to his usual game plan, Sarah, or decides to switch things up. We will see. But one thing's for sure. Both Wink and Lamar have great respect for one another. Number eight gave some love to Wink on Wednesday, and you know Wink returned the favor. Ain't no telling, you know, Coach Wink known for his um, exotic blitzes and you know just doing this thing. Um, shout out to Coach Wink. He is an unbelievable player, and for anybody that wants to say anything that he's not, okay, because he's unbelievable and he's playing at an MVP caliber right now like he was back in 19, all right? And it's, it's, def it's different sitting in the chair now instead of practice when you're watching it. And it's like I told uh, Drew Wilkins, 
all those times we were going against him and the guy said, oh, I got him, you know, because he's got to stay away from the quarterback. Oh, I had him. We're going to find that out on Sunday, whether or not they got him or not. Bobby, it feels like we have a wide receiver conversation every other week. That's probably because the Ravens are so thin at that position, but there is some buzz online regarding Carolina Panthers wide receiver DJ Moore's availability via trade because of an expected overhaul coming after head coach Matt Rule's firing earlier this week. Yeah, Sarah, bear with me here. I'm wondering where this buzz comes from. Is it really because of this CBS Sports staff writer Cody Benjamin who basically just put together a list of five potential landing spots for more and featured Baltimore at the top? Like, really? I mean, come on. Even Ravens fans are always looking for the next wide receiver. Anybody anybody whose name comes up, the fans make it a big name. But yes, yes, Cody Benjamin added to that. So let me guess. You aren't buying into his list. Heck no. What I do buy into is the Panthers potentially making significant changes to their roster, though. Like, that makes sense given what's happening within that organization right now. And Sarah, maybe DJ Moore does end up becoming a trade piece for them. But at the same time, if a team were to acquire him, they'd be committing to a pretty hefty annual salary for Moore beginning in 2023 that would run through 2025. Don't forget, the former Maryland Terrapin signed a three-year, $61.8 million contract extension this past summer. So, just throwing that out there. Yeah, that's a big number, and we all know Baltimore hasn't really paid wide receivers these days. But hey, if I'm Eric DaCosta and I'm in Baltimore's front office, I'm at least picking up the phone. What about you? Are you at least picking up the phone to inquire about DJ Moore? Partner, EDC can inquire all he wants. I just feel like the Ravens' recent moves have told the story for how they've done and continue to do business. We know no team spends less on wide receivers than Baltimore does. We know cap space is limited, to your point, and we know that this front office is much more willing to sign veteran free agent wideouts on team-friendly deals in recent seasons. Of course, Demarcus Robinson is this year's. While EDC and the Ravens could absolutely be active, ahead of the league's November 1st trade deadline. They obviously have been in the past. I don't see wide receiver being the position of choice. All right, but let me throw this scenario out at you. What if Rashad Bateman's foot injury is more serious than what we've been led to believe? And by the way, I don't think it's more serious than that. This is just a hypothetical. Okay, now that's where I could see things getting interesting, right? Bateman missed his fifth straight practice on Thursday, Sarah, and he hasn't been in game action since injuring his left foot in the third quarter against Buffalo, he walked out of the bank that night with a boot on, and we have not seen him since. That game was played on October 2nd, so that's a fair point. A matter of fact, Sunday against the Bengals, Devin Duvernay was the only Ravens wide receiver who received more than two targets. So all of a sudden, as you said earlier, it's a thin room yet again. So I think you make a great point. While we obviously hope Bateman's setback doesn't continue to linger, should it choose to do so, which is completely out of his control, maybe EDC and the front office are forced to do some shopping. Something to think about. All right, and before we jump, some other quick news items that you need to know. Beginning with this from offensive coordinator Greg Roman, who was asked about Ronnie Stanley's season debut after Baltimore's left tackle played a light 22 snaps. He looks just like he did right before, you know, that unfortunate injury. So, um, you know, and he's coming along. You know, he'll obviously play more. I'm not going to give you the, the snap count number, but he's going to play more. And uh, we just hope he can continue to trend in that direction. You know, he's a very talented guy, and very valuable, valuable to us. It can kind of change the way we leverage things a little bit when he's playing. And hey, more good news on the offensive side of the ball. Running back Justice Hill. He returned to practice Thursday for the first time since sustaining a hamstring injury in that Buffalo Bills game. So the only players that didn't participate in practice due to injury were Rashad Bateman and Ben Cleveland, each with a foot issue, and Justin Houston with that growing injury. Also, we all know the Ravens' rush defense has played at about an average level so far. It ranks 12th in the league. Meanwhile, one of the most dangerous running backs in the league is up next in Saquon Barkley. Now, if you're nervous that Baltimore won't be able to contain Barkley based on their efforts against the Bengals' Joe Mixon last week, just know this. The Ravens were content 
with giving Mixon yards to protect against the pass, and they won't need to do that against the Giants' pass game. Here's NFL Network's Brian Baldinger breaking down how the Ravens approached Mixon last week. Baltimore had a fascinating game plan against Joe Burrow and the Bengals, held them to 17 points. First downs, they were in cover two. Safeties, Marcus Williams, Chuck Clark, they were 15 yards deep. They were saying, okay, if Joe Mixon can hammer us for nine yards a carry, which he did on some of these runs, not all of them, but us, we'll live with it. We'll live with these runs. We're a man short in the box. We understand it. But even at the snap right here, like the safeties are still getting deep. They're still protecting against the deep ball. So the result was, while they had some good runs on first down, not enough, and not all the time, this is just five of them, like they were willing to give this up. Thanks for listening to the Morning Ravens Vault. We created our show to keep you plugged into all things Ravens. If you've been enjoying our content, please tap that follow button and share it with a friend. We can also be reached by email via Baltimore Ravens Vault at gmail.com. And as of last month, the Ravens Vault podcast is now available on YouTube and closing in on 1,000 subscriptions. That was one of our early goals. So consider subscribing to our channel ahead of week six against the G-Men. All you have to do is simply search Raven's Vault Podcast on YouTube. And that's all the time we've got today, but we'll be back with our instant reaction episode after the Ravens Giants. If you or someone you know is interested in advertising on our podcast, hit us up at BaltimoreRavensVault at gmail.com. And as always, thank you for listening to the Raven's Vault. Raven's Vault.